Great, thank you. All right, well, good morning, everyone. And behalf on uh, behalf of the American Rock Mechanics Association, our technical committee on induced seismicity, we welcome you to our monthly webinar series. So the induced seismicity committee, chaired by Amasad Kasami, myself, Sean Maxwell, a co-chair, Jens Lindstern, and Mari Haddad, we, we welcome you to our webinars. So today we're excited to, uh, if I can advance my screen, we're excited to have Hong Feng Yang from the Chinese University of Hong Kong speak on uh, Sheshuan China frac induced seismicity. So an interesting topic and uh, we're, we're excited to hear more about what's happening in, in China. So before we pass it over to uh, Professor Yang, just uh, a few housekeeping things we want to touch on. So first of all, just to speak to the upcoming schedule. So next month, the first Friday, April 5th, we have Nadine Egonen from the UT Dallas will be speaking about seismicity in the Eagleford. So interesting topic. And of late, there's been uh, some larger events taking place in the Eagleford. So look forward to that talk. And then May 3rd, we have Lei Jin with ExxonMobil. So Lei will be presenting on uh, Delaware Basin seismicity, looking at potential mechanisms of, uh, of triggering from both shallow and deep uh, disposals. So again, a, a good topical discussion, and we look forward to, uh, to that presentation in May. So with that, we want to take a moment and uh, just invite Andy Bunger, and he's the president of ARMA, to say a few words of uh, of talk about uh, talk about ARMA. Over to you, Andy. Sure. All right. Well, thanks, John, and uh, and to the committee for the chance to 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 stop in and see you today. Um, I, congratulations to this technical committee um, for sustaining this. Uh, uh, this effort over the past several years for reaching now the 49th webinar. Um, and I think that the induced seismicity um, technical committee illustrates a big part of what I think ARMA is very good at doing. Uh, if you go back more than a decade and a half or so ago, the, the activity in induced seismicity had not ramped up yet. And over the past decade and a half to decade, a lot of, of rock mechanics professionals have moved into this area, really um, leveraging on the multidisciplinarity of rock mechanics as a field in order to address something that is of huge um, interest worldwide um, for a variety of reasons. And so I think we're seeing that now happening in, in other areas in subsurface storage, um, in, in aspects of, of mining and minerals, I think um, ARMA is a is a great place where we where we can bring together that multidisciplinarity of our profession in order to adapt to those to those needs. So I think this is uh, this is a great illustration, and and thank you all for participating in that. Um, I when I talk to people at our symposium who only know us through our symposium, I say, look, ARMA is fifty two weeks of the year. And this um, technical committee is part of that. Um, also, some people know us only through our technical committees um, and the seminar series. And if you've never joined us for a symposium, I'd like to welcome you to uh, to do that. This is actually, uh, many of us are, are trying to get our papers submitted by today. It looks like we're going to have probably a thousand papers in this year's symposium, roughly. And uh, that'll be in Golden, Colorado at the near the end of June. Um, so I'd like to extend that that offer and that welcome to to come and join us and continue the conversation in person. Um, and we'd always love if you're not an ARMA member to have you uh, to have you join and be a member of ARMA, receive our newsletter, be a part of those distributions, post your job opportunities, all those things that that you can do. We'd love to have you a part of, of our community. So thank you for joining here. And to those who are a regular part of this um, microcosm of our community, uh, thank you and thanks for the opportunity to join you today. Great, thanks, Andy. I appreciate that. And 
just as a reminder, the as as Andy mentioned, the uh, annual symposium in Golden this year is coming up. So next month we'll uh, we'll give an update to people on induced seismicity talks within that symposium for for awareness. But but thanks again for the the words there, Andy. Appreciate it, and thanks for your service to uh, to Arma. So with that, going to pass it over to uh, to Madi to talk about the. The rules of engagement here. Mari. Good morning, everyone. This is Mahdi Haddad from the Bureau of Economic Geology. So before going through the talk, uh, I would like to highlight some of the housekeeping uh, points uh, about this webinar. Uh, first, we have a distribution list for the invitation email. Uh, email. So uh, if you know any of your colleagues who are interested in this topic, please uh, talk to them about this webinar series, we can add them to the distribution list and they can directly receive the news about this uh, webinar series. And please submit your questions during and after the talk in the chat function at the bottom of the Zoom meeting window. We may need to paraphrase these questions in order to use the time more efficiently. Uh, so please send these questions to everyone. And this specific meeting is recorded uh, after consultation with the presenter, and this uh, recording will be uploaded in our YouTube channel. <clears throat> Please subscribe to that, cha that channel to receive uh, the uh, updates about our uploads. And before going to the talk, uh, everyone will be uh, muted during the talk. Uh, in order to have better use of time, please uh, stay muted during the talk. and. Uh, in the question and answer part, we can uh, the organizers go through your questions, and then after that, in the informal part, we can uh, uh, you you can get unmuted and uh, uh, you talk uh, and ask your question in person. Uh, so before uh, without further delay, let's uh, invite Hong Feng to take over the stage. Dr. Hong Feng. All right. Thank you very much for the invitation and also for and also letting me know more about the organization and also the webinar. I'm going to share my slide again. So are you able to see my slides? We can, but you're not in uh presenter mode. There you go. Perfect. Okay. All right. Um good morning, everyone. Um I'm Hong Feng Yang uh, from the Chinese University of uh, Hong Kong. Um, and today is my uh, great pleasure to uh, introduce uh, some of our recent work on the uh, earthquakes that occurred in the shale gas field in the Sichuan Basin, China. Um, given this um, background or the audience, I assume everybody is very familiar with the induced earthquake. Um, so here, and then I don't need to uh, go with some more details, but then it is well known that a different kind of uh, anthropod uh, human activities may induce earthquakes. And then uh, considering the current uh, CO2 emission and also the climate change, the challenge we face all together, and then it seems to have a uh, you know, demand with uh, the more energy and also the clean energy and then with the less pollution. Therefore, there are you know, a number of uh, actions and then including uh, different kind, kind of uh, subsurface fluid injection and extraction, which may induce earthquake. So out of uh, different kind of a new or the so-called cleaner energy resources and natural gas is considered to be a very promising one. So this is um, our focus of the study, and that's, I'm going to talk about more. So um, this is, um, the natural gas is in a, a dire demand around the, all countries globally, and which is especially true in China. So if we look at the, the figure on the left, and then this is the China's energy consumption by source. And over the years, we can see the majority is still the coal, but now it's a decreasing, but then still close to 60% up to 2020. And then the crude oil as shown in the yellow, it remained nearly a constant. And then we can see the increasing in the blue which representing 
uh, the natural gas. And then the green represent the renewables and some others as well. So we can see the natural gas is, uh, is increasing, but still taking a relatively small portion. And then uh, to consider the natural gas production in China is mostly in the Western part of China. And I, I know there are the uh, characters in Chinese, but they are just the names of the different provinces. This is Xinjiang and this is the Sichuan and where I'm gonna uh, talk a, uh, a lot more. So the Sichuan production is uh, accounting nearly, uh, well, 21%, but this is the data back in 2016. So up to now, the most updated one, I think it should be a, uh, a little bit more. And then talk about the Sichuan because I'm going to talk about the earthquakes. So then I want to give you some, you know, larger, uh, tectonic setting. And so here, um, this part represent the Tibetan Plateau, the Qinghai Xijiang Plateau, and then due to the collision between India and the Eurasia, and then the rising of the plateau, and then cause the eastward and southeastward um, extrusion of the materials. So when the materials or the plateau rising and meet the Sichuan Basin right here, um, so this is uh, written in Chinese, but here Sichuan Basin is a very old basement and Precambian basement. So then, then they build up this uh, Longmen San uh, mountain and the Longmen mountain, that's uh, where the 2008 Wenchuan earthquake occurred. So indeed the Sichuan Basin and the surrounding regions, if we think about the earthquake hazard and normally we will think about those major block boundary faults like this, uh, the Haiyuan Fault and Artai Fault, and these the Kunlunshan Fault. And each um, red circles over here represent the earthquake with magnitude larger than seven. And then with this symbol uh, represent the earthquake larger than eight. But then if we look at the, um, the Sichuan Basin itself, actually there is no earthquake larger than that. Indeed, historically in, in the within the Sichuan Basin, then there were not many earthquakes larger than five at all. Um, but in recent years, especially in the past decade also, and if we take a zoom in, um, uh, look on the Sichuan Basin, then we see a lot of earthquakes, especially in the southern part of the Sichuan Basin. So here I use uh, three different colors representing the earthquake beach balls. And with the red one represent the Weiyuan shale gas field located over here. And then uh, the purple one represent the Lushan earthquake. And then uh, a couple of years ago or three years ago, there was a, a moment magnitude 5.4 earthquake occurred. And then the blue represent the Changning uh, shale gas field. And then with the largest earthquake of 5.7 and then a few others larger than five. So in terms of a magnitude, the Changning uh, Shale Gas Field has the largest uh, earthquake and also the most number of the earthquake are larger than five. And then in comparison, Weiyuan, actually the earthquakes are relatively smaller, but some Weiyuan earthquakes are very shallow and extremely damaging. Therefore, in this talk, I will use the examples mostly from Weiyuan to introduce and what we have been working on and what we have found out. So what happens in the Sichuan Basin in the past few years or in the past decade? So um, it's uh, quite clear that um, on this figure, we can see that is the annual shale gas production in China. And then you can see the bars and with the, uh, with, with the unit of the 10 to the nine, the billions of uh, cubic meters. So it's increasing fast um, rapidly every year. And then at the lower side, we can see the annual number of the earthquakes with local magnitude larger than one. So before 2015, then nearly we see very rare earthquake less than five per year in the entire Weiyuan shale gas field. But then since 2015 also we see not only many number of earthquakes, but also we see this red curve representing the release assessment moment. Uh, around 2019, the earthquake be becomes larger and larger and become more damaging. 
including some magnitude uh, larger than four and five earthquakes. So why we, um, you know, we are experiencing such kind of uh, uh, earthquakes. Uh, so this is a monument representing the first ever shale gas vertical well that has been finished in 2009, December. And then uh, three, I think three years later, and then they finished the first horizontal well drilling and then in the William Shale Gas Field. And then two, two years from, from then, then they start to have the, you know, massive scale of fracking and then uh, production as well. So this is about the time when we start to think about around 2009, the ever, uh, first ever vertical well, and then around uh, 2011, 2012, and then we finish the first horizontal well, and then with uh, another two more years, and then they start with, uh, you know, very large scale uh, fracking and pr production. So this figure, um, so with all the Chinese characters uh, representing the different uh, names of the uh, counties and cities. So what I'm focusing here is in this area, but the blue color indicates the geological reserve and also the, the estimated um, uh, reserve for the shale gas in different, uh, in different part, actually representing the thickness of those uh, target uh, shale layer. So um, not only Weiyuan, but also this is uh, Changning and then also the Luzhou and this is the Chongqing and then for the North. And so there will be more development uh, in, in the future. Right now, there the majority is focusing on the Changning and Weiyuan and also the uh, Luxian, different, uh, three different shale gas field. So these earthquakes, as I mentioned earlier, some, some of them are very shallow and damaging, especially in Weiyuan. So uh, up to now, since 2015, and there have been in, in the three shale gas fields in total, 17 earthquakes with magnitude larger than five and more than 130 earthquakes with magnitude larger than four. And in Weiyuan in particular, in 2019, February, and then there was a magnitude, moment magnitude of 4.3 earthquake, which caused a significant damage and also led uh, to death. Therefore, it caused, uh, you know, a uh, strong societal uh, response and then, you know, causing a lot of attention from not only academia, but also public and also governor and industry as well. So then since then, then we start to work on the earthquake in the William Shale Gas Field, and then trying to understand how these earthquakes occurred. So these are some questions or some unknowns about the uh, earthquakes that occurred in this Trump Basin. So uh, they are damaging, and then there are some of them are quite large in terms of induced earthquakes. And then we, we are curious what may control their magnitude and then also we are interested, certainly uh, what mechanism is dominant or is uh, responsible for occurrence of a certain earthquakes. So I guess uh, the audience should be all familiar with the three mechanism proposed to explain the inducing earthquakes by fluid injection or extraction. So if the uh, fluid is hydrologically connected with a fault, then this is a well-known pore pressure diffusion which can cause the fault to move. Even the fault is not hydrologically connected to the uh, injected fluid, poor elastic effect may still cause the fault to move if the orientation of the fault is in favor of uh, the failure. And more recently, um, then has been also suggested that the injected fluid may not, what well, the, in, the fluid may enter the fault, but the fluid diffusion is obeying the diffusion law may not go that far, um, but the fluid in, uh, injected fluid may cause the fault to experience a seismic flip, which may travel much faster than the fluid diffusion. Therefore, it may trigger earthquake in distance. So this has been uh, su um, 
suggests that were found by the evidence in uh, Canada and then also validated by numerical models. So these three are believed to be the main mechanisms for the uh, earthquakes induced by the fluid injection or extraction. But then we are curious whether all the earthquakes occurring in the Strum Basin can be well explained by these mechanisms. And even more intriguing and also challenging is that it is very common to see that some very large or damaging earthquakes occur sometime after the injection got stopped. And then not only in the sugar gas field, but also in geothermal and then some other uh, settings as well. And then we really want to understand the mechanisms that make, you know, lead to those uh, post-injection and large and damaging earthquakes. And then the more general challenging question is that often some large earthquake occur on the unknown faults. Before the earthquake occurred, we didn't know there was a fault large enough to cause the damaging earthquake. And then what we can do to better prepare for the seismic hazard and then possibly to mitigate the uh, seismic risk. So we try to target different questions. And then first I want to show you some, you know, background about the Wuyuan Shield Gas Field. So uh, it's located in the southern part of the Sichuan Basin. And Sichuan Basin, as I mentioned, is very old. So if we look at this blue line representing a profile shown on the right, upper right, and this is the stratigraphy and then interpreted from the high resolution seismic reflection line. Um, so on the to the west, then we can see from the topography there is a high. So this part is the Weiyuan anticline. So it was uh, uplifted, possibly due to the rising of the uh, Tibetan plateau, and then within forty million years, and but down to the basement. So the basement is around five to six kilometer in depth. And these are very old uh, materials and mostly Precambrian materials. And for the target shale layer, which is uh, represented by this white line over here, that is Lurian and, uh, and also quite old stuff, and but around two kilometer below the anticline and then uh, deeper to three to four kilometer at the different depths and moving down to the flat part of the basin. So this is the so-called Longma Sea formation. And then that is dated uh, uh, Silurian. Um, as in this profile, and then we also protected our uh, high resolution uh, relocated earthquakes. Uh, the most seismicity are concentrated around three to four kilometers. And then around this injection or the the uh, rich shale layer, the target shale layer. And then with some uh, earthquakes extending even in down to the basement at a certain part. And then down to the basement as a very old uh, time. And then we can see there are two boundary rift faults. And there was a um, you know, very old rift uh, process going on, but then based on the strata above, and then that process was stopped a long time ago, and we don't see obvious uh, feature in the shallower uh, stratas. So the Weiyuan shale gas field, oh, by the way, um, because in China, then there was no public data repository or public information on those uh, platform on the fracking platform and also the time when they do the uh, operation. So in my talk, then when I show the uh, drilling, the platform, for example, those are white um, symbol, and this is either from our field visit or from our um, you know, collection based on the satellite images or from other literature. Um, but then, uh, most earthquakes in the William Shale Gas Field are dominant in the thrust mechanism, including not only those damaging ones and the larger than four, and also the small ones, and that was derived by based on the dense array and uh, record, and 
uh, that is shown in the green triangle in the field. So all the seismic stations in around 2019 and were shown over here by the black triangles and the green triangles is showing a temporary dense array that was deployed for a year in 2015 to 2016. So this um, temporary seismic network and together with those black triangle permanent network were used later for us to conduct the uh, double difference tomography to obtain the structure and the seismicity. So the first part, I want to show the seismic structure and also the uh, earthquake locations. This work is done by my PhD student, uh, Jinping. Um, so basically he derived with the high resolution uh, seismic structure. So here on the left column, we are showing the P wave structure on the right. And then we are showing the S wave structure at the depth of two, four, six kilometers. So if we compare with the reflection um, profile, if we um, see those seismic velocities, for example, at the six kilometer, the two uh, panels at the bottom, and then you can see clearly the low velocity, and this is well consistent with the uh, very old early stage rift, and then uh, the material, and then because it's younger than the uh, neighborings. And then we, um, when we move to shallower depths, then we can see some velocity contrast, but certainly they were not following uh, you know, any map the fault on the, uh, in the region. So for example, this, there's a morning fault over here, which is a rather shallow tear fault due to the rise of the wave and anticline. But then we can see, you know, it go across with both low and high velocity, uh, regions. So basically this velocity, uh, structure, uh, is not showing us you know, uh, the clear uh, boundaries delineated by the fault and because the faults are in the relatively small scale. Uh, but then the seismicity are showing well concentrations at the different clusters we can see later at this uh, plot. So here then, if we look at the seismicity, clearly they show some very clear uh, spatial and temporal clustering for the entire William Shugas field. And then uh, one obvious feature is that uh, some of them were associated with those uh, known fracking platforms, but not all fracking platforms are associated with earthquakes. This is also very common and true in other shale gas field as well. Uh, but if we look at the earthquakes on the right figure with magnitude larger than three, then all of them are within certain you know distance less than uh, around five kilometer from the William anticline. So because the William anticline was later raised due to the collision, what well, due to the you know the collision between the Tibetan plateau and the Sichuan basin. So we infer at the flank of the anticline, then the stress accumulation should be what well, the strain accumulation should be larger than those more plain uh, areas further away from the anticline. So in that words, and then the magnitude, at least in in the William Shugas field, it seems to be more correlated with the pre-existing tectonic setting, and for those uh, you know earthquake larger than three. Um, then also I want to show you more details regarding one earthquake cluster shown here, which is called the Shangshu Tang cluster. And we are interested in this cluster because there were known uh, fracking platforms and also there were public report with the leakage from different points, at least three points from this uh, uh, fracking uh, platform. So these earthquakes were not uh, generated during the fracking, rather they were generated after the fracking process was finished. So that we show the earthquake in color representing their occurrence time. And with this color actually showing the earthquake occur earlier, and then this color showing the earthquake occurring later. So again, this is also 
uh, indicating that the earthquake should not be uh, generated during the fracking. Then what we like to see is that how the earthquake got migrated and then what mechanism might be possible or um, might be responsible for these earthquakes. Then we plot the seismicity in different time window because we don't have exact or precise operation data of fracking. Therefore, we use the seismicity. We use the first seismicity as a reference time. Therefore, the time, for example, 2.5 days and represent the earthquake since the first earthquake in the region. So we can see a feature which we denote as the, the factor one and then emerge in those 2.5 days. But then also we see a small cluster and in quite a distance from the fracture over here and then getting emerged. And then uh, with another two and a half days later, then we see this cluster actually extending to, uh, you know, clearly delineating a new fracture over there. And then we also see another cluster emerge over here. And then as time moves on another five days, and then we see this uh, fracture number two and then seem more clear and also the different fractures and extending into different directions and the new fracture, the number three emerges over there. And then as time goes on and then we can see it more clearly. Then we plot the distance versus the time and for different fractures, if we look at the fracture number two and three, so then we plot the earthquake um, distance versus time and seems the most earthquakes are following those of the diffusion curve with the diffusivity about 0.1 or less meters square per second, which is a reasonable value. However, if we look at the, the fracture trees spot one, and then most of the earthquakes are still below this blue curve and with representing a diffusion front and although with a larger value over here, but we do see some outliers especially this cluster one, and then that is too fast for the fluid diffusion. And also based on that, we can see this is from a different fracture. Therefore, it's, uh, you know, for us, it's hard to, to think about any existing uh, mechanism that can possibly, you know, uh, trigger this uh, seismicity. Therefore, we want to think about, so the question is how can we, uh, explain earthquakes that occur and certainly before the pulse fluid diffuse uh, arrive and then or even before the aseismic uh, slip front arrive because it's on a different fracture. So if we think about the fluid diffusion process and then given some time and then fluid diffusion may goes to a distance range like that and then in the same time aseismic slip may go further but what about the uh, seismicity we may observe either in another uh, fault or even in further distance. So that's what we see in the Shanxi uh, town cluster. Therefore, we form a hypothesis that if we the fault patch with different stress heterogeneities, then even given a small stress perturbation, either due to the fluid diffusion or due to the aseismic um, propagation, then may lead to the nucleation of the earthquake, thus generating the earthquakes in distance. So the details about this model is uh, uh, listed in this paper with the leading author of my postdoc, Yu Yun. So I want to next uh, just uh, briefly introduce the model setup. So here we set up a 1D fault model and then with the fault patch a velocity weakening and then uh, embedded within the velocity strengthening. And within the velocity weakening, then we also set up a stress heterogeneities. And we don't know how much the stress is, uh, you know, uh, higher or lower than the ambient uh, fault. Therefore, we test a large range of the parameters over there. And then we uh, prescribe the fluid injection at certain points as a constant rate over here. And then uh, we just see how the fault may respond to those fluid injection. 
So here I'm going to show you some uh, modeling results. Um, so here, the first one is a reference case without injection for a return state governed fault. And if you just run it for a certain amount of time and then in the velocity weakening uh, patch, then you're supposed to see some nucleation and then some propagation. Here, because our uh, velocity weakening, weakening patch is rather small, therefore we see uh, the nucleation of the event, but then the maximum slip of velocity is on the order of 10 to minus five meter per second. Then that is the typical aseismic slip range. So it didn't nucleate uh, earthquake at all. Uh, but if we compare the case with some injection with even lower injection rate over here, and then first we see the same event still nucleate within the um, velocity weakening patch with the time also the same comparing to the reference case. And the slip rate is also the same for the low injection rate. But the difference is that we do see some um, you know, very minor, uh, minor or oh, small scale uh, aseismic slip being nucleated, or well, at least in the slip rate faster than that, uh, than the background slip rate. And also we mark the pore fluid diffusion front in with those uh, pore fluid uh, stress perturbation 0.01 megapascal. And then also we also mark a red line that is the coolant filler stress with 0.1 um, megapascal. And then later we want to observe the change for these different uh, contour lines and to see the response in the uh, velocity weakening uh, zone on the fault as well. So now if we just uh, use this as a low injection rate, and then again, it is still aseismic, and then the coolant failure stress is lower than the pore fluid diffusion front. So meaning that in the perturbation of the stress is uh, still not beyond the pore fluid diffusion zone. However, if we increase the injection rate, so for example, here is a two and here is five, then we can see clearly um, there could be a aseismic slip being triggered by those uh, pore fluid, well, by the injection of the fluid over here. And then that aseismic slip and then start to propagate, but did not enter the uh, velocity weakening patch. And then uh, given the our simulation time over here. However, around 20 days during our uh, model simulation, then we can see this red curve front representing the coolant filler stress of a 0.1 uh, megapascal, and then already uh, you know, reached that far in the fault velocity weakening patch. And then that stress perturbation actually did not immediately trigger earthquake, rather promote this patch to nucleate earthquake a few days earlier. For example, here is 51 days and here is 45 days and then a event nucleating over here. And most importantly, this one with a low injection rate, the slip rate is still low. So even with the nucleation, then that is still in the aseismic regime, but here is uh, 0.01 meter per second. Therefore it is already evolved into uh, earthquake. So here then we define this as a earthquake in the model. So if we keep increasing the injection rate and then we can see, you know, the slip rate is increasing, also promotion time is increasing as well. But here the key point is that the pore fluid diffusion is still within this distance given the 60 days, even after the earthquake occurred. And ASS makes slip front is also within this distance, not reaching the uh, velocity weakening patch but an earthquake already occurred. And that is due to the stress transfer caused by both pore fluid diffusion and also uh, uh, the aseismic slip that is triggered by the injection of the fluid. Um, so if we keep increasing the injection rate, then we can see the, uh, the occurrence time for the earthquake will be further advanced. 
and then now it says uh, only 33 days. But again, the asymmetric slip and did not reach the velocity weakening zone yet. So this part is again promoted by the stress transfer itself, but not by the slip front of the asymmetric slip. If we look at just one point on the fault, for example, at the four kilometer representing by the black dice line, and then we plot the slip over here and also the coolant filler stress representing by the orange line. And we can see the coolant filler stress with 0.1 megapascal uh, arrived there around 12, 13 days. But then that is before the asymmetric slip occurred. And even after the asymmetric slip get there, but then not reaching the uh, velocity weakening zone, then that earthquake occurred, therefore significantly increased the slip and then propagating over here and then increase the slip at this point. So again, in this case, high injection rate. So it's further advanced the occurrence of the earthquake, but it's not due to the asymmetric slip front reaching the earthquake zone or the velocity weakening zone but this part is promoted by the stress transfer. So by um, summarizing that, then we think the previously we consider, you know, the uh, pop fluid diffusion and also the asymmetric slip and also the pore elastic effect. But then we did not explicitly uh, consider the increasing stress transfer that is caused by the asymmetric slip and also the poor fluid diffusion as well. So on the fault, therefore, based on you know what we observed in the Wu and Silk gas field, then we propose uh, a new mechanism that is possible to trigger earthquake in distance and also to trigger earthquake on the different fault as well. So that is the first part. Then um, we seems to be able to offer some insights on the questions, what controls the earthquake magnitude in Wuyuan, and then large earthquake is still close to the anticline, so, and still related to the tectonic setting. And then not all earthquake can be explained by the known mechanism. Therefore, we propose the increasing stress transfer, uh, but still, uh, you know, on the post-injection, occurrence of the damaging earthquake and then also earthquake occurring on unknown faults, then we want to further explore. Therefore, I want to introduce another example, which is the largest earthquake in the Wuyuan Silk gas field that occurred in September 2019 and with a magnitude, a moment magnitude of 5.0. Uh, and then uh, three months later, then further Northeast, and then there is um, another earthquake with a moment magnitude four point nine. So these two earthquakes are also very damaging as well. So this magnitude five point zero earthquake is uh, caused a very clear ground deformation. So this is an insert image showing the ground uh, deformation. Therefore, by integrating those insert observations and also our well constrained aftershock distribution then we delineate the rupture area on the fault. And here the color dots represent all the aftershocks. And then the most aftershocks are around the, the edge of those ma major slip area. So using this aftershocks, and then we also try to understand, you know, how these earthquakes are uh, linked with the known fracking platforms in the region. But I need to point it out, although we plot two uh, fracking platforms over here, but these two were finished at least three months earlier than the main shock occurrence. So in the past three months before the main shock, then there was no fracking. So here then we show the seismicity, including um, all earthquakes that occur within the rupture area, which is shown in this purple line, and that is, a, you know, uh, constrained by the INSAR observed uh, ground deformation. And on the right, and I'm showing you two panels, and on the upper panel, which is the fracking induced seismicity, 
And here I use fracking induced seismicity to represent the earthquakes that are very close to the injection layer and in depth, and also temporarily very clustered, as we shown over here. And at the lower part, and then we plot the occurrence time of the earthquakes representing the unfault earthquakes. So these unfault earthquakes are clustered based on the waveform similarity, and then we conduct a clustering. Um, at one platform over here, H37, then we know the uh, fracking time, which is representing by the light blue with the background. As I said, it's finished at least uh, three months before the occurrence of the mirror shock. So even on fault earthquake we see has been continued for a long time, at least a half a year before the uh, main shock. Uh, but then those, those fracking uh, in directly induced uh, seismicity are very temporarily clustered. Therefore, it didn't occur much after the fracking got uh, stopped. So the question is, how long did the fault got activated? Then we want to use those seismicity, both on fault and also the well-located seismicity to conduct the template matching, and then to search the seismicity all the way back to 2015, because the since 2015, then there are a lot of earthquakes in the wave and shape gas field. And then we conduct a clustering based on the waveform similarity, and then to differentiate whether the earthquakes are on the fault with where the main shock occurred or is not on the fault. So here I'm showing you three different panels with here upper uh, three representing the map view um, and lower representing, representing the cross section. So on the left, then we are showing you uh, more than six months ago before the occurrence of the main shock where some very uh, well clustered earthquakes were uh, identified in depth, then they are very close to the injection layer of the, uh, the Loma C formation. So then we define them as the fracking induced earthquakes. And then uh, the grid represents the unclustered earthquakes. And then we can see there are some earthquakes occurring on the fault, but then majority during this time, and then uh, it's still uh, those uh, fracking induced earthquakes. But then for those four shocks that are detected by the uh, by our well uh, relocated template and also later clustered, and then that is showing in the middle. So then that is representing color dots, representing the uh, earthquakes occurring on the fault as well. So then we do see a lot of uh, seismicity before the main shock occurred. And the aftershocks is dominant and then well delineating the fault plane as well. So then when we date back to 2015, then what we found out, so here is the different, um, again, upper panels representing map view and lower representing cross section. So if we look at the left, then from 2015 to 17, for the three years, the most earthquake we found within this region are very close to the injection layer. So then we found very few or maybe just a couple of earthquakes are close to the fault plane, but the majority is the fracking induced seismicity. So in that case, then we don't think the fault is activated, but up to 2017. But in 2018, then we found a lot more seismicity. And then with the different fracking platform in operation with one known as H39, uh, and this uh, platform generates the earthquake very close to the injection layer as well. However, it also uh, lead to the earthquake occurring on the fault. So in this case, then we interpret, so the uh, injection, the fracking activity at this uh, H39, and then possibly in you know, cause the fluid entering the fault plane and then and, uh, migrating into greater depths and then causing the earthquake occurrence. 
So again, this is uh, 2018, more than a year before the occurrence of the moon shock. So if we look at the 2019, January to February, and here then, because there were no nearby fracking um, op uh, operations, and then we found a lot of earthquake occurring on the fault, but then not many uh, fracking induced seismicity. So again, this is the indicator for if there's a fluid diffusion, then the time is enough for the fluid to migrate further and then to the fault plane. But then the earthquakes are still quite small. Um, but then if we look at the, from March to the September before the uh, main shock occurrence, and then we found both fracking induced earthquake where the H37 platform were in operation, also the occurrence of the earthquake on the fault. So based on these uh, seismicity distribution, then we um, we can find the time point what the uh, the timing when the fault got reactive uh, with it, which is in 2018, more than a year uh, before the occurrence of the main shock. So if the fluid already get there, but then did not cause such an earthquake, and then what is the relationship between the different fracking, for example, during 2015 and 2018 and 2019, and are they related to generation of the main shock? And so again, we try to uh, answer such a question. So these are just the fact that I already uh, explained for another view on the Raptor plane where we can see the most concentrated on fault uh, earthquake before the occurrence of the main shock actually are more concentrated in the segment or called the P1, which is in the southwest segment of the Raptor plane. And after the main shock, and then we see the blue and then basically fill in nearly uh, everywhere of the Raptor area. And the key point is that at least three months, no fracking before the main shock occurrence. Therefore, we want to understand whether the different stage of the fracking may contribute to the generation of the main shock if they do and the, and the what mechanism. And given that the core fluid should have arrived over there. So our hypothesis is that, and uh, similar to our previous model, and the injection may generate a multiple episode of asesmic slip, but some asesmic slip were self-arrested, did not lead to the generation of the earthquake. And then by the cause of the perturbation on the fault plane, but then later, uh, injection caused additional asymmetric slip, and then they may uh, lead to nucleating of the earthquake. So here again is the um, modeling results. Um, so it, here we consider in total more than three years, and with the first injection, and then it generates some asymmetric slip over here, and then get uh, arrested. It caused the stress perturbation, and then propagating into much further distance, but then not causing the generation of the earthquake in the velocity weakening area. And uh, for the H39 injection, so this is about two years uh, after the first injection in the region, and they caused the asesmic slip. So in this part, and then we also zoom in in the right figure. So it caused the asesmic slip, and then even after the injection at this platform got stopped and then asymmetric slip is still propagate and then propagate into the velocity weakening area. However, it did not directly cause the earthquake occurrence. But during the propagation of this post-injection asymmetric slip, and we can even see after the, uh, the end of the injection at this platform, and then we can see a locking front at uh, some other part of the fault. And then at the start of the another platform, it's 37, which is further away from the fault, but then also caused post-injection asymmetric slip. And then it seems the two slip front and then eventually, uh, you know, uh, get together in the velocity weakening zone and then eventually trigger the earthquake over there. 
So here the time scale is rather long, therefore we don't see the co-seismic process very clearly, but then we can see there's clearly a large slip of velocity over there. So this is uh, when the earthquake got occurred. So in this case, then we interpret the three or the multiple uh, injections nearby in the region may cause the different uh, episode of the aseismic slip and then leading to eventually the occurrence of that main shock. So that poses a significant challenge in terms of uh, evaluating earthquake hazard and then mitigating the risk, especially for those, you know, uh, long delay, the long term after the post the injection. It is really hard to, you know, obviously traffic light system cannot work in such a case. And then how can we possibly determine whether there might be a large and damaging earthquake coming, even though we already, you know, the, the uh, operation is finished. So here, I think the key point is that whether we can possibly identify a fault that is large enough and then also reactivate it in nearly real time. So based on seismic seismicity relocation, that is you know uh, actively done in different parts, including both academia and industry, but it's turned out to be challenging. So our uh, thoughts goes to whether there are any differences in the source properties of the earthquakes, especially those fracking induced earthquakes, and then the earthquake occurring on a nearby fault that could generate a damaging earthquake. So uh, this uh, work is done by my postdoc at Tier one He proposed a new method and to estimate uh, uh, the stress drop of the earthquakes with more accuracy. And then we just uh, determined the uh, stress drop of all earthquake in the William Street gas field given sufficient data coverage. And then using our clustering analysis, and then we again divide the faults, the earthquakes into off fault and on fault groups. And then we plot the stress drop value and then comparing them. So we found those earthquakes in the wave and shale gas field when they occur on the fault where the main shock occurred, and then their stress drop value seems to be uh, older larger than those earthquakes that uh, you know occurred directly during the uh, fracking operation or in other uh, you know neighboring operations of the fracking. Uh, although the if you see the values of the stress drop for individual earthquakes are pretty much scattered, but overall the median value is, seems to be uh, quite different. So if this is the case overall for other shale gas fields in the Sutran Basin, then we may hopefully use such an approach to tell us whether a fault is uh, um, activated uh, or reactivated and in nearly real time so that we can offer a meaningful warning for the operation so that we can, uh, we hope to extend this work to investigate more earthquakes, even in other sugar field in other uh, part of the world. So uh, given the time, then I want to just uh, briefly summarize that we have done quite some work in the Sichuan Basin and in different shale gas fields, taking the Wei as an example. And then we found some you know, phenomena and that invoke a new mechanism, which is the stress transfer caused by the aseismic slip that can trigger the earthquake in distance or in different faults. And also we propose the multiple slow slip may be responsible for the long-term delayed triggering of the damaging earthquakes. And also, um, at least in the William Civil Gas field, we found the stress drop of the earthquake on fault are much larger than those uh, induced directly by the fracking. So hopefully it can provide a meaningful warning for the reactivation of the hidden fault. So with that, then I will stop here and happy to take any questions. Great. Well, thank you for the uh, the excellent overview, Professor Yang. Really appreciate your participation and uh, lots of interesting data and uh, and uh, hypotheses kind of presented here. Um, just kind of aware of the the time here. I think maybe what we can do is. Uh, um, 
maybe wrap up kind of the formal part of the presentation and then we can pull questions maybe for more informal discussion uh, afterwards if you're willing to stick around for a few minutes and answer questions but uh, um, so maybe just to kind of wrap it up the formal part at least so on behalf of uh, ARMA, the American Rock Mechanics Association, and the Induced Seismicity Technical Committee. We uh, we thank you for the participation today and uh, thank everyone for, for joining the webinar. Um, just a reminder, the next webinar is going to be uh, April 5th. Nadine Gonan will be uh, talking about Eagleford Seismicity. So uh, look, watch out for the invite from Madi and uh, hope to see everyone uh, 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 early uh, early April. Um, Hong Feng, do you yeah. maybe what yes. we can do? There's a few uh, questions here and maybe we can uh, just invite the, the people posing the questions to unmute and uh, and just uh, just ask them directly if you don't mind. Sure. yeah, of course. Sounds good. So the first one is uh, Cheng Ho Li. Um, had a question back on slide 16. Uh, 16. Ching Ho, are you, are you there? Would you like to unmute and pose your question? I'm a distance, I guess. This yeah, one. I'm, yeah, I'm here. Can you hear me all right? Yes. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, I'm just wondering those, uh, mm, I, would, I would say those uh, earthquake. I'm not so sure it's really an earthquake um, because they're, the, the the size of it, I'm just curious about with what kind of magnitudes we're talking about, especially magnitude associated with time. Because, I mean, you're talking about uh, uh, typically a fracking operation that we're talking about micro seismic uh, magnitudes. So negative three, two, or, you know, negative one. And then I was thinking, you know, whether, whether those are really coming out of micro seismic events or is really, uh, there are a whole bunch of, uh, like a fracture network somewhere uh, above the, uh, the main fault. And, you know, those fractures, if they're yeah. under critical stress condition, then maybe, uh, maybe able to get to that magnitude that you talk, the so called earthquake magnitude. Just a thought. I mean, yeah, first I should clarify that uh, the earthquakes I'm presenting here are not the micro seismicity. That is due to the new generation of the new fractures, you know, to, down to magnitude three or magnitude two. And because right now most of the data are uh, analyzed by the surface stations, so we don't have the power to resolve that magnitude. So the earthquakes I'm showing here is uh, mostly about magnitude two, magnitude one to two. So in this figure, and some earthquakes are larger than three and the damaging ones are larger than four. So these are, uh, I would say definitely not the micro seismicity. Uh, and also, as I said, and these earthquakes, this earthquake cluster is not generated during the fracking. Yeah, otherwise it should follow with the uh, with the different fracking uh, lag and from the toe back to the uh, platform. Yeah, so certainly it's, it's same first they emerge over here and then expand and then later this one towards the toe. So that's just, uh, I, you know, for us, this certainly this is the induced earthquake. With the, on a related note, with the migration of the seismicity with time, are you seeing increased magnitudes as the uh, the length of the activated faults increase? The, the, oh, yeah, the that's a good effect? question. Um, in this cluster, no, we don't see such a change in magnitude with time. Interesting. Um, and then the next question is by Robert Hall. Robert, are you... Sure, and I guess, yeah, just on that same slide on magnitudes with time um, or events uh, and diffusion processes, I guess the cluster one that occurs earlier, uh, further away from the stimulation, I guess uh, first thoughts were certainly the existence of sub-seismic 
uh, faulting and that the fluid moved into that cluster along a fault and fracture beyond the diffusion front. Um, that seems to be the easiest explanation. Um, quite often, building stress heelward of the actual pad is is quite common, and those events can kick off certainly post uh, stimulation in that two two and a half day kind of time frame. Any comments? Uh, I think for the F one, if we only uh, focus on this fracture, then certainly uh, I think the seismicity can be explained by the fluid diffusion. Um, but really, what uh, puzzled us is the emerge of this cluster in the very you know early stage and then as we see here this is more often this is a different fracture so uh the because the first assessment sesame state is emerged here anyway therefore if the fluid diffuse along the fractures something like that and then we don't think it can you know go that far and also this is a different fracture so this is why we 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 uh, we try to understand, you know, how the earthquake occurring on a secondary fault or a nearby fault, and then in relation with the possible, you know, powerful diffusion and also possible aseismic slip driven by this powerful diffusion on the fracture number one, and then generating those clusters. Thank you. So Thanks I think the, the person that asked the next question, I think had to jump off, but uh, maybe you'd like to respond anyways, just asking on the, the example that you show in slides 30 to 32, you're just wondering. 30, 32, the ratio seismic uh, cumulative. Yeah, so I think it's the ratio of how much moment release from just the big events compared to the total catalog. 30, 32. Is, is this one? This modeling? Maybe the, the example that's being modeled, if you uh, if you can go up to the slides before this for the, yeah, this, maybe this example. Oh, this one? Yeah. Um, whether this is related to the moment release? Uh, well, certainly the moon shock will, will be much, much larger than all others. And then if we think about the moment release and then um, I, I don't think I don't think all other earthquake can be, you know, even to the total. And then as, because main shock is 5.1, uh, 5.0. And then all others, the largest, the largest or first shock has a magnitude of 3.4 also. Yeah, so it's too small. And all others, and then as I'm showing here, mostly about one to two. So in terms of our cumulative moment release, um, but I, yeah, we 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 didn't we didn't compare that. Um, here is we just a uh, focus on the fault, well the earthquake occurring on the fault, but then we haven't considered whether there could be any change in the moment release. I guess that's his his question. Yeah, as you pointed out, it seems like most of the moment release would be with the, the main shock, though, given right. the, but, this contrast. But I guess if the question refers to whether seismicity before the main shock is showing any change with the moment release, yeah, that could be an interesting point. Yeah. Okay, then the next question is by Bill Ellsworth. Are you, are you there, Bill? Uh. I think Bill is running to another meeting. Uh, okay. But this question, um, in the view and shift gets field over here, um, the salt water disposal actually was not done, was mostly, 
So basically, we are, we are um, you know, the most earthquake are occurring within this part. And then in the anticline, there are some earthquakes, but not many. Um, but then some waste water disposal was mostly conducted within the anticline, but then not within this part. Therefore, uh, you know, waste water disposal over here is uh, probably did, did not, as far as we know, there's no waste water disposal wells around this part, mostly within the anticline. So is that deep? Is the disposal targeting a deep layer close to basement, or is it uh, relatively shallow injection for disposal? Um, they are not very deep in the anticline. Yeah, I don't. I don't think they go much much deeper. Yeah, I, I could be wrong, but I suspect. Uh, the context of Bill's question is probably with that delay for the, again, that, that case study with the, the magnitude five with the, oh, yeah, with yeah. the few month delay after frack, if that could be maybe associated with disposal of injected water once those frack wells were turned on. But are there disposal wells in that other example? Um, there's, you know, I as I said, and then um, we don't think there are any disposal wells near where the uh, magnitude five occurred. Whether production related stress changes as a contributing mechanism, we consider that. Um, but then it is just an opposite process comparing with the injection. So then um, the most dominating part is the is is the wells over there and then so basically we consider the wells within certain distance distance if it's a production then normally in Sichuan the production will the most efficient production will last for like half a year or so so in yeah in that part I'm just trying to show you the all the injection wells we found. Yeah, for example, over here within the main rupture areas, and these are all the injection wells we found and then surrounding that and then there are a few but in further distance therefore the stress change and then impact would be much smaller than those are much you know closer um, but i can see bill's points on that and certainly but then it will be an opposite process and if we take our model then it's Basically, it's just a negative, what reverse what we we are seeing. Great, thanks, thanks for that. Um, I, I guess I was going to ask a question if I could. Um, sure. Yeah. Do you know is there uh, have there been regulations put in place? You mentioned a traffic light uh, system and. We are in uh, in context of some of the mitigation approaches, but uh, are the regulations requiring traffic light protocols now for these areas, or are you aware? Not put in place yet. There have been some ongoing research to see whether this is feasible, and then to what category and what kind of a criteria to make a decisions and so on. But I don't think there's any. Uh, active protocols already you know uh in 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 there i see interesting right. thank you um well i think we covered all the questions in the chat window but uh is there's a number of people still on if anybody has a question feel free to uh, pr provided you have the time Feng to stay around for a few more moments
again, reflecting on the fact that it's very late for you, we appreciate you uh, you uh, coordinating the, the our time here. But uh, does anybody have a question for Professor Yang? I have a question. Sure. Great presentation. So regarding a slide 30 that you said the, the uh, disposal wells are in the anticline and far away from the cluster of events, I was wondering uh, how long uh, those disposal uh, wells have been active because uh, 10 kilometer scale that you showed on that map is relatively small for the effect of uh, poor pressure disturbance after disposal of wells for a couple of years. If you consider several years of water, salt water disposal, it may reach to that the, the, to the clusters that you dis, you discussed in this presentation. Yeah, yeah, that's a uh, that's a good point. Uh, disposal. Yeah, here are the challenge, frankly speaking, because we don't have exact data how much and how long it has been going on over there. So then we got partial data. And then what we know is that uh, disposal has been conducted since 2015 or 16 also around that time, but then how much? And then we, we don't exactly know. Um, based on what I communicate with those, you know, industry, it seems like um, they don't have a lot of uh, flow back fluid in a lot of our fracking platforms. Mm -hmm. And yeah, so basically where the fluid go and we don't know exactly. Uh, I don't have time to show, maybe, maybe I can quickly show one slide over here because there have been report, public report of the fluid leaking. But then where do the fluid go? Really, we, we have no idea. Uh, but then uh, one of my students um, found a very interesting problem uh, waveforms over here. As you know, as a seismologist, and then we really love to see such kind of waveforms starting, you know, with wiggle to wiggle identical in the P wave time window, but then very different in the S wave. And the two earthquakes are very close to each other. Only difference is one is slightly deeper, the other one is shallower. And then, so we, we think this is an indicator of some subsurface fluids reach zone, but then we, we need more work to pinpoint where it is and how much it may lead to such a change in both frequency content and also the amplitude. Interesting. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. So yeah. So for the disposal thing, and really, you know, I I don't know more about that. Yeah. Great talk. Thank you. Oh, Hong Feng, it's very late for you. Early early morning now, your time, I guess. But uh, maybe we should wrap this up. But uh, really appreciate your uh, presenting today. All right. My pleasure. And thank you for all your comments and suggestions. Pleasure. Yeah, thank, thank you. you. Bye. Thanks everybody for, for attending. Okay. Thank you, Dr. Hong Feng. Okay. All Have right. Good weekend. Good to see you. Yeah. yeah. Thank you. Bye bye. Nice thank you. Bye -bye.